PVP is right around the corner. I'm going to be talking about a lot of things, including PVP, open beta. You can see all the cards down below. I'm not going to spell it out for you, but there's a lot to talk about. The first thing I wanted to say is I have, don't think I've officially or formally congratulated you on your marriage. So congratulations for all that. And I hope you had a good time. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was unbelievable. It was uh, it was a good break as well. I hadn't uh, I realized I hadn't had a break like that in probably over ten years. So it was uh, <laughs> it was really really good to to take that time. And obviously, getting married was uh, sensational. So thank you. I'm glad you're back, and I'm glad I'm glad you're well rested. Even even I burn out so often, and yeah, I can't imagine what you're going through. So let's jump straight into it. The first thing is. As it says in the title, the thumbnail and everything, PB3, which is PVP and Overworld PB3, and the open beta have both been delayed. Do you want to talk to us about kind of like what happened there and why they've been delayed? Yeah, so I think a lot of it comes down to uh, our estimates. You know, we, we have a process that we've stuck to for at least the last 18 months. The, the first 18 months of... of uh, development i would say it was a little bit loose but we've tried to to hone that in we brought on multiple producers but at the same time we're trying to simultaneously build 24 different projects you know from web to blockchain to gaming and and so it's an extremely large project as you know it has a lot of people that uh, that are working on it, and so it's very hard to get to a, a precise estimate. Mm. It's super unfortunate that we weren't able to to hit our uh, Q3 estimates, uh, but we've now brought on another person that will sit above the producers who mm. has 15 years plus experience, has worked at companies like AWS, running super agile teams and and remote work and and stuff like that 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 can handle this this type of stuff and that's not to say that the the devs have done a bad job or, or anything like that they're, they're trying to estimate things as best as they can it's just a lot of components that go into to delivering what we're doing and yeah un unfortunately we uh, we missed it i don't want to say it's by a lot you know, and I, I don't have an exact date for you, but as you've seen, we've we've been able to play for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're really following it closely, you could you could probably tell that we're we're not too far off. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear it. I'm very excited to try my hand at PvP. Um, I feel like that's where my skill set in terms of gaming tends to shine. Is I, I love anything with mind games, really, and I think PvP is going to have that for me. So. The, the next thing I want to talk about is actually straight out of the town hall that happened merely four hours ago. So anyone that's watching that watched the town hall, I think you're going to like this one. In the town hall, you mentioned that you connected your IMX account and you built a deck in the deck builder that you could play with PVP with. And that felt unreal to you. But I don't understand some of that because an account on the Aluva decks is not necessarily an IMX account and you connect your wallet and everything. So were you playing it on Go Early or are you hooked up to the blockchain at all or anything like that? Or just kind of like, what did you mean by that? Yeah, it's it's on Testnet, but you are connecting up to, to IMX, right? Like you, mm. you, you need an IMX account to be able to do that. And yes, we've proven that we can do that uh, with the uh, with Aluvatars and you know obviously that that functionality works but this is a little bit different in in that it's attaching to the game client and so for me it, it was the first time that I've really seen the connection between the two and to watch that deck pop up as soon as I created it on the the web and eventually the deck builder will uh, will we'll be integrated into the game. But just seeing that connection was was more proof that we're really, really close. You know, that was that was quite a big thing for me. Yeah, so that's that's really crazy. So I just have to ask, and I have a feeling the answer is no, but if you capture your alluvials in the overworld on testnet, are those the ones you bring into PvP or is just everyone getting distributed the alluvials or it's the PB3 won't be on testnet. 
No, so so PB3, you, you're going to be able to have, you're, you're going to be able to try out any, you, you can build a deck right now with all the alluvials that we have mm -hmm. integrated. So then they're not going to be, there's not going to be a connection between overworld and uh, an arena until open beta. So we'll give you the ability to, it's, it's almost everyone that's that's going in. There's there's about five lines mm -hmm. uh, that that are missing, okay. but the experience is is pretty crazy, right? And again, the reason that we're giving everyone all those alluvials is because it's a beta. We, it's a private beta as as well. We want you to test them out. We want you to be able to figure out what are the best combinations and uh, and yeah. So that's that's why it's so important to register and 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 get into that beta early mm -hmm. because can learn all about the different combinations. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the meta game is obviously going to start building in PvP. So there's going to be a big advantage to testing it out and seeing it for yourself. Even like watching influencers or whatever is one thing, but testing it for yourself is going to be a whole different experience. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, and this one's a bit of a, a bit of a weird subject, but in my eyes, PvP is the flagship title for Alluvium. But it's felt a bit unusual, and I'm sure there are plenty of great reasons for it, but it's felt a bit unusual that the Alluvium Arena or a PvP has come out last. <laughs> We've gotten closed betas for everything else well in advance of PvP. Can you talk to us about kind of the strategy behind that? So why is it our flagship? Who says that? <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of people are mostly keen for it, but in terms of games that are popular or have large player bases... A multiplayer games definitely take the cake for that. I think PvP serves that quite well. And Pokemon is not really that popular or it's a multiplayer game. Yeah. <laughs> but what <laughs> my, my point there is I, I and I, I sort of touched on this in the the town hall earlier today. I think that's a product of people who are holding mm. ILB saying, Oh, we've we've seen what the overworld is because for all intents and purposes, there's a few updates, there's a few tweaks, and, and there's a couple of new features that will be in for open beta, but people realize, hey, this, this is going to be what it is, mm. right? And I, I, I think the, the fact that we don't have 30, 40, 50,000 people playing that game is what's causing people to go, ooh, let's, let's sort of forget about the overworld a little bit mm. and let's hold out hope for PvP because that's going to be a competitive mode. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm not saying that Overworld is going to be the flagship and the most popular game that we have. I'm not. I'm just mm. saying we also don't know that it's going to be, uh, that it's going to be Arena because I believe the minute that you can go into the Overworld and you can capture these creatures and then you can go and sell them on the marketplace or you can see their value and 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 you can see how rare they are with the different stats that they have that's the point where people are going to say regardless of how they capture them just the that ownership piece that sits in there that you don't get right now because it is a private beta once that's unlocked people are going to flock to the overworld, right? Like we've, mm. we've seen how many people there are in developing nations that want to grind and grind and grind <laughs> and are willing to do so. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of those people versus a highly competitive, highly strategic uh, auto battler, right? Like, yes, TFT has 15, 20 million players, but it doesn't have the same opportunity to earn as what the overworld does, right? So that's why I say mm. I don't know which one is going to be the flagship. <laughs> uh, you know, they both have uh, a lot of attractiveness. And and so, you know, I'm not willing to, to say that. I know what I am going to play the most, which is uh, Arena and, and mm -hmm. the PvP component of it. But, uh, but, yeah, so I guess drawing that back to your question of... Uh, mm what like why is it taking us so long is it's it's just that's just the way that that things have uh, have worked out we had a whole bunch mm -hmm. of work that we needed to do in the overworld we had to uh get out a, a base version of the auto battler in survival mode 
And, uh, you know, it's just taken us time. The simulation is a very, very, very hard and complex thing for our backend dev team to, to mm. be able to, to work out. So there's been some bugs, there's been some crashes, but, you know, as I said, it's around the corner. I think, I think for me, the most exciting thing about the Alluvium ecosystem in general is definitely the interoperability between the two being Overworld and PvP. I don't know which one I'll spend more time in, but I definitely understand what you're saying is that exploring and collecting them is definitely half the battle. And I think I, think I, like, I like the way you, you framed that. And I definitely think we haven't seen what the Overworld is capable of quite yet. And I'm excited to see the future of that. So, And it's even worse, right? Because if, if you are going to play Pokemon, right? And you're going to play Pokemon in a private beta, the whole idea of Pokemon is capture them all right and mm. and obviously there's battling and stuff like that which which is the the competitive side of it but the exploration mm. creature capture is all about seeing them and capturing them all and going into your account and showing your friends and saying i've got every single one in this set it almost feels like when i'm in the overworld it almost feels like well i'm doing this for nothing even if there wasn't the 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 actual NFT ownership of it, you still know that your account's going to be wiped. And so at the back of your head, you're thinking, mm, you know, I may as well just wait until the, the real thing launches. And so that's why I'm saying people are underestimating what's going to happen once that, that actually occurs and NFTs are enabled inside of the overworld. There's, a, there's actually another Web3 game I started playing recently because it's soft launch. And I played in their betas and things for like an hour each time their beta came out and they soft launched. And they're like, okay, no more resets. And now I find myself playing it all the time. It's very passive. I'm not like, it's not like on my screen, I'm playing it heavily or anything, but but I just, I just find myself playing it all the time. And I'm like, yes, I think this is what Overworld is going to feel like, but it's going to be even yeah. more engaging and things like that. So it's, it's very exciting stuff. So um, moving on from that, when it comes to other multiplayer games, things like TFT and League of Legends, they release a patch to their live game almost every two weeks. And even on their test nets and things, they're updating patches and things pretty much every day. Um, so my question is, with survival mode, I know we haven't really updated a lot. It's a closed beta and all the rest of it. But moving forward and as we go into the open beta, do you think we're going to have frequent updates and patches to to fix up the game as we go? Or do you think we'll try and keep to like a, a longer schedule, a month, two months? I, I Look, we, we definitely are going to need frequent updates. There's going to be uh, rebalancing that we need to do of, of, character, <clears throat> of characters, of armor sets, of weapons, all of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to sit here and say that we can, we can do that on a weekly basis or even a fortnightly basis. Uh, but the intention is to have regular updates, right? Like we're, we're a much smaller team than, than what uh, Riot has and, and even the team that's mm. assigned mm. to Teamfight Tactics. So, uh, but, but it is meant to be dynamic and it is meant to be updated constantly, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that's really great. I think some people kind of got upset about that with like the survival bite beta and things like that, because mm -hmm. at one point guys that were super broken, they're like, they felt like it was unplayable to a certain extent. You know what I mean? So I think, I think people yeah. will be excited to hear that. So the last thing I've got on the arena topic is this has been a hotly contested debate for some time and it's kind of died off lately, but I just wanted to get your opinion on it. TFT is our main competitor and completely free and Hearthstone um, I did some research and it's about 50 to hundred dollars to get a meta deck. They have all these other mechanics such as the dust and all that sort of stuff. But basically what I'm asking is how much do you feel would make sense for a competitive deck or a meta viable deck to cost in Alluvium, uh, in the Alluvium arena to compete on the leaderboards? Uh, I think, you know, we, we've got to make it accessible to mainstream audiences. We, we absolutely do. And obviously we're, we're going to have the free mode where you'll get access to characters mm. and, uh, and, and you can play and, and, and that is still competitive uh, as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be able to get a, a decent deck, I would say it needs to be somewhere in the realm of 50 to $200, like, mm -hmm. like around, around that. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think I think there's a lot more overlap in this sort of stuff. Even in Hearthstone, once you get a competitive deck for, say, Warrior, you've got all those Warrior cards that can't be used with anything else. But in Alluvium, it's a bit different. Your Atlas might be able to be used in 10 different kinds of decks very easily. Um, so I think it's a yeah. very different structure altogether. So we'll move on to the overworld portion of this uh, conversation now. If the thing will swap. There we go. Overworld. So the first thing is we know that PB3 for both Overworld and the Arena are coming at the same time. But I'm not exactly clued up on what new features are going to be in the Overworld besides new alluvials and the polish to the environment. But I've been told, Grant has said very publicly that the polish is pretty incredible this time around. But is there anything else we could expect to see? There's not a massive amount. So there's new alluvials that, that are going to be added in. Uh, there's... There's three alluvials. Uh, give me one sec. You mentioned oh. the squid, buffalo, and yeah, the sloth. yeah, and the sloth as well, which which are all pretty cool. Mm. Uh, so so they'll be added in. Uh, there's a couple of uh, tweaks to to like the movement mechanics and and stuff like that, which is makes it much much more polished. And then just the the overall. You know, I hate to not come with new features <laughs> and stuff like that, but realistically, the the focus has has definitely been on uh, arena for for this private beta. But uh, but yeah, you you're gonna see a, a lot better, even on the the alluvials as well. Like the polish on those in in game is is much much better. So they kind of went really really hard to get all of the features into private beta too. They, they were sort of playing cut, catch up there. And there was a little bit of, uh, I, I would say like tech debt to, to get things mm. really, really polished. And so they've been working on that. And again, that's fine, right? Like there's, I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but there's some cool features that are coming out in, uh, in, in the open beta for Overworld, but mm. For this one, it's more about just making things uh, like really, really smooth. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it anyways. Grant keeps saying Abyssal Basin got a big facelift and that was my favorite that was my favorite region as soon as I stepped into it. So the next thing I have to ask you about, and this pertains to some of the conversations surrounding fuel that we had a little while back. We haven't heard much about fuel costs for the overall travel lately. Obviously, I wrote this question before the town hall. <laughs> But personally, for me, with mobile microtransactions, because I've been doing a little bit more mobile gaming lately, I don't love it, but I've been doing a little bit more of it. Basically, mm -hmm. anytime they ask me for a microtransaction that's over $1, I pretty much ignore it. I just I just can't justify it for a mobile game. But if it was $1, I could see myself doing it 100 times over the course of a couple of weeks. You know what I mean? Like, it's mm -hmm. definitely like that. What are you feeling for the upper rail for fuel costs in the overworld? And like, I know you're talking in people that are, that are like economists and that sort of stuff and you can't mm. really disclose what it is, but would you like to see it like dirt cheap, like 50 cents? Or would you like to see it closer to $5 for the more expensive runs? I, I think it's somewhere between like, like depending on the stage that you're going to, if you go to a higher stage, it's going to cost you a little bit you know, more, but mm. it's not really up to, I mean, I'm only one person in the council, so it's not mm. solely up to me what, what we set this as. But I th and definitely the game design team is uh, is going to be the the ones that put this forward. For me personally, I think somewhere around the five dollar mark for that first stage, stage two maybe twenty five to thirty dollars, and then the higher stage is like fifty dollars plus. Mm. I uh, I think that that makes sense. It's tough, right? Because it's you know that that's super palatable for. A, a crypto person but when you're talking mainstream and you know fifty dollars plus yes you can go and capture five six seven alluvials in that run which you amortize the cost there you know it's mm. it no longer seems crazy but it's mm. still that whole argument of that's you know the entire cost of uh, of one of these triple a games in you know in totality so I don't know. It's it's hard to balance between the Web three people and uh, and the mainstream people, but yeah, I think that that's sort of a middle ground that that could work for everyone. 
Yeah, I, de I definitely think that there's so many different variables to consider that it's really hard to make a call on something like that. But um, I think for me, it comes down to what does that money really give you? And the five to six alluvials is a really good, a really good way to think of it there as well. But I think if I were, if I wanted to play the game for a whole day, then if it cost me five dollars for every run, that might cost me fifty dollars for the day, and that's that's mm -hmm. a little bit much. But if it cost me five dollars overall for the day, that doesn't mean one run costs fifty cents. That just means a run lasts you a day or something like that. I think I think I like the idea of you not you either ask them to transact a lot of times and it's super cheap, or you don't ask them to transact very often, but you get to play for a long time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean you definitely aren't going to be like one run is not going to last you. 12 hours so what i think <laughs> that's uh that's going to present even even more issues but uh but yeah like the 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 cool th the way that we've tried to build it is mm. if you're good in the arena if, if you're one of the better players then you're not going to need the most powerful characters right it, it will literally come down to your ability to play the game and uh and, and that is, I think, the key there to, to strike that balance where the pros, if they're getting paid to play by an esports manager or whatever, then yes, they're going to go out and try and get the best decks, which, which might be at that higher price point. But for mm. that mid-range player that doesn't have any sponsorship, they're going to be able to play something that will cost them, say, 200 bucks to, to get mm. a deck. And it's not going to have the best characters, but if you're good at playing it, you'll still be able to rank really high. And that's mm. when it comes down to the gameplay and the strategy and, and stuff like that. So that's like, like the, the sweet spot that we're looking for. And uh, yeah, but you know, we're, we're still not at that stage yet. We, we got to work that out. For sure. For sure. So we will jump into the Alluvium Zero questions now. And I did have a lot of pe questions from the community and things like that, but a lot of those questions specifically were taken up in the town hall. So I'm not, I'm not trying to do too many repeats or anything, but, um, but we'll, we'll keep going with this. So this one comes from Loy Loy. I believe he commented on Twitter. What are some of the future pe plans for Alluvium Zero? Because Nick teased something in the Discord and he teased that something big was coming. And I'm, you know, I'm a huge Alluvium Zero fan. I yeah. want to know what is going on. <laughs> so there, there is something that is uh, has, has has been discussed. Uh, I've spoken to Johnny about it at length. I'm I'm not going to leak it today, but Nick isn't even aware of, of what that is. So <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not sure what he's alluding to. But in terms of uh, you know, you, you can expect content updates. You can expect like new buildings and, and stuff like that. Uh, connection into other games and then potentially even being able to bring your ranger in to, to check out people's land and, and stuff like that. But we're talking, <laughs> so awesome. you know, way, way into the future. See, that, that's one of my favorite things about the way the studio does things in general, but especially for something like Alluvium Zero where... You're using proper 3D models and assets. You're not doing it all 2D, which means you have the option for turning it into a 3D environment whenever you want to. Obviously, it's not that simple, but um, at least you have the option and it's going to be faster than it would be otherwise. So the, the next thing I'll talk to you about is with Unity shifting their structure on the runtime fee and all that sort of stuff, do we plan on moving Alluvium Zero to Unreal Engine? Do you know if that's difficult or not? I'm not really familiar. Definitely not. Uh, Unreal Engine. Uh, we we haven't been we haven't been considering that. We have looked at a couple of other platforms that uh, that that we might use, but it, nothing is. We're we're, we're kind of waiting to see how this shakes out. Obviously, mm -hmm. we, we've gone and 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 built a team of Unity devs that are you know experts in their field, and and so the idea of replatforming is not ideal, mm -hmm. and. With with how much is sort of shaken out of the tree over the last week, we're we're still waiting to to see where things land, and uh, and so yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you yet, but but very very unlikely that we would go to Unreal. Awesome. All right. Well, I can't wait to see the new features in Illusion Zero, but for now we will move on to the open beta. So I hate to ask this, I really do. 
But the game has been delayed many times now. Obviously, this one seems a lot more minor than some of the ones in the past. Um, but many in the community and just generally when it comes to these sorts of things, many of the community feel this is business as usual. A lot of people were assuming there was going to be another delay because they had seen delays in the past. Do you think there's a chance open beta will be delayed to Q2 or Q3 of 2024? Look, I'm, I'm reluctant to say what I think just purely based on the fact that we've literally just hired someone two and a half weeks ago now mm. who it, it's his sole job to sit with the producers, <laughs> to work with all the, the dev teams that are building for, for open beta. And we're going to have a very, very accurate, uh, or let's call it a much more accurate timeline for everything i would say in the next couple of weeks so i'm reluctant to to say it what i would like ideally is no no more delays <laughs> you know, it, you know, obviously but there are the factors you know like the the i said this in in discord the other day we can't it's it's not like we can sit here and choose when we release you know at a certain hmm. point there are factors which will make us have to release something. And, you know, we're already in discussions internally to, you know, what, what does that look like? Do, is there something, is there some sort of mode that we can add to PVP? And it's not something that mm. we want to do. We don't take it lightly, but mm. you've got to look at the, the, reality of the situation and if it comes to that sort of thing then we have to start generating revenue through the game some way shape or form um, you know or the other option is you raise some more capital and that has its own restraints and stuff like that so you know it's it's all a work in progress but i would say in the next couple of weeks we'll have something to the community which will give them a much more accurate idea of, of when things are coming yeah, I think I'm excited to see kind of where you guys come from that. I think even after you hired Nick, because he, he was doing a lot of that sort of stuff as well. Even when you hired Nick, all the timelines and understanding of where things were at and stuff improved dramatically. And I think I think there's been a big shift. And I'm looking forward to even more big shifts. And I think I think that's really great. And it it shows that you're maturing as a studio as well, which is which is really important. So for the open beta what are your primary KPIs? Okay. Now I've got my own that I think would be top of mind and things like that, but you know a lot more about this subject than I do. So revenue players, engagement, um, how many players do you want to hit at the end of 2024? What, are, what is the major sort of top level stuff you can share with us today? Uh, so, this, come from, this come from Lenny. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, no worries. Thanks Lenny. Uh, so <laughs> look, I, I would say uh, more pessimistically, I would I would like for us to be able to activate around about ten percent as as a minimum here, right? Of of our existing audience that have registered to play one of the three games. Now, that's going to get us to to that one hundred and fifty thousand mark. Mm -hmm. Then you've got uh, I, again. I would ideally like to see at least another hundred thousand that are activated. Uh, that, that are new acquisitions, right? That mm -hmm. from all of the different campaigns that we do over the next, like call it six plus months through partnerships and, uh, and, and gameplay and the trailer and all of those things, I think we should, we should be able to uh, acquire another hundred thousand that would give us somewhere between 200 to 250,000 uh, monthly active users. 250,000 would be absolutely awesome. I think I think everyone's hoping for that. I don't think I'm the only one. Um, yeah. So I had a question I was going to ask and I forgot what it was. Oh, right. Okay. So in the community, especially those that are crypto native or came from crypto, there's many that believe that the crypto bull run is going to kick off in April 2024. And there are some that are even wishing that Alluvium waits to release open beta when the bull run kicks off, if it does at that time, obviously I, I don't necessarily agree with that. What do you, what do you think about trying to time open beta? Generally speaking, um, do you think that is this possible for a good option there or not really? <laughs> so 
I get this a lot, right? Like saying like <laughs> a, a deep, deep down, a, a, you guys know what you're doing. You're just waiting for the next bull run and, and all this kind of stuff. The, ra- the, the reality is no, right? Like we're, we're not waiting. We're, we're trying to build this thing as fast as possible. We truly believe that if like our goal here was always to compete with mainstream, it was to, uh, to remove all the barriers to entry, to make it so you don't even know you're playing a crypto game, right? Now, if you do all of that and you make it fun and, uh, you know, competitive and interesting and it has replayability, all of those things, then we should be able to compete with mainstream. And if we're competing with mainstream, it doesn't matter if it's a bear market, bull market, they don't care. They don't even care about crypto, right? Like it doesn't matter. So the, the real answer is no. We're not waiting. (laughs) Do I think that it could line up almost perfectly myself? Maybe, you know, (laughs) it's not like we sat there and we're like, okay, the the next Bitcoin halvening were uh, that will launch that month. But, you know, that's it. it, If if we lead into that and uh, and we have our products just, you know, launching before that, then I guess we're just lucky. (laughs) Yes. That's glad to hear it because I think I think timing things is just going to be a bad idea because if you're wrong, that would really be bad. <laughs> but, but yeah, so this one comes from Layla Hole. That's how I pronounce it. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing it wrong. But um, what sort of progress has Alluvium made in regards to connecting the blockchain? Now, I know you talked about it briefly in the town hall and different bits and pieces, but overall, where, where are we looking? We're making some really good progress. We, we had We hit some hurdles. Uh, at the start of this year where we're mm-hmm. working out how we actually what what are we going to build this technology ourselves as in like our, our account system which connects up to uh, mm. to the blockchain and, and how we actually register your assets on chain and the reason we we were looking at building it ourselves is there, there were a few features that were more uh, more tailored towards card games right like obviously gods unchained it's their their marquee product mm-hmm. it's built by by imx that works with with a card game but for <laughs> us uh one thing in particular was being able to have a session where you you don't need to sign mm-hmm. transactions multiple times in a single session so let's just say you've got uh a sword that you want to create, right? And you've got to have a whole bunch of gems and ores and, and you know, whatever. Mm. And you need to go and get them. And it's it's a whole session. It's taking you five, six hours to go and capture all of the things that you need to to, to use in the forge to, to actually make this sword. You don't want a situation where you have to sign 55 different transactions in order to be able to actually uh, create that sword. Mm. So... Uh, we went back to them and we said, look, this doesn't work for us. And again, they, they sort of, are, they're using us as an example of what uh, more games in the future are going to need. And because we touch on so many different genres and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of this stuff is like world's first in terms of actually connecting it up on chain, they listen to us right and they they hear our feedback and they went away and they said you know what we're going to implement all of this and uh and and yeah so we're going with imx passport solution it's really really good and Mm -hmm. it's looking like we'll have that complete by uh by the end of this year which you know at a at a time we we didn't think that was going to be possible so that's good yeah yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. It also frees up your own blockchain devs and things like that to do some of the other stuff that you need um, for Alluvium. So I think, I think, definitely think it's a win-win, and it's a, it's a big win for IMX as well because it's going to be. I, I've looked at a lot of Web three games, and there are some great ones coming out, but none of them are still trying to do what Alluvium's trying to do, especially with the interoperability, right? So mm-hmm. um, I think, I think it's going to be a big win for everyone. So the next thing is now. I ask this question to myself quite often and I'm going to ask you now, but after PVP is in beta and those four or five lines of alluvials are quite close to finish from my understanding, what are we really missing for open beta? The three regions have been polished up and they're looking pretty good. 
we're missing alluvial leveling and you're saying that the blockchain stuff is almost done. What is the main stuff we're missing in terms of development and testing to actually go to open beta? It's testing. It's, it's mm. getting community feedback. It's getting our, our QA team's feedback. Our uh, game design team needs to, to tweak things. There, there isn't much that's left after that point. As long as, you know, when I say end of this year with IMX, we don't want to situate, like we, that needs to be done and then we need to go and do a whole bunch of testing to make sure that yeah. that works. You know, they, we can't have vulnerabilities right at the end and say, okay, well, we finished everything on, uh, you know, December 30th and then go, all right, let's now go out and launch the game a week later. We've got to actually make sure that all of these uh, dependencies are working, test everything, and that process will likely take, you know, a couple of months, if, if not a little bit more. And, uh, and so that's why there's, you know, it's not a crazy amount that isn't done. It's that last five, 10% that, that takes, you know, just a decent amount of time. Yeah. I think, I think even with, um, you're talking about that with PVP in the town hall today, where you were saying things like it kept crashing, like it was playable, but it crashed like every action you did. And it's just those Getting rid of all those bugs sounds like a, a big effort, um, but I'm glad you guys are close. And I think you're probably going to run into similar issues with, with open beta, connecting everything and so on. So the next question, I had a lot of questions similar to this come from the community, um, but this one in particular is from Layla Hall because I like the way he phrased it. If the open beta launch failed to reach a considerable amount of players, let's say not enough players to sustain revenue for the DAO so that the DAO had runway, right? What's the contingency plan? Well, it depends what you call a considerable amount of players, right? Like if 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 we're talking revenue generation, it's as you say, we need to be generating enough to uh, to to offset our mm -hmm. operational expenses. And as as you guys know, that's around a million bucks a month, right? So now the tricky part with that is. Theoretically, if everyone was staking, the DAO would only be making around uh, something like 15%. Yeah, right? 12 like to 15, a, yeah. Yeah, around, around that, right? Now, at the moment, it's something like 30% that we're making mm. because there's hardly, and, or not hardly, there's still a ton, but there's, <laughs> there's not as many people that uh, are staking. Now, I don't know, maybe when the game launches every single person who holds an ILV token stakes it, that'd be amazing. There would be hardly any, uh, you know, liquidity, hardly any sales. It would make the, the, the price, uh, <laughs> it would do some, <laughs> let's just say it would do some interesting things for the price, but, uh, we have the ability to tweak that, right? Like if we, if we went out and say we we're mm -hmm. generating only $2 million of revenue, I would say the council would step in and say, hey, we need to go to the community. Someone needs to write an ICCP that uh, weights the, the DAO's uh, vault percentage as higher, the, a treasury percentage as higher than what it is in order to recoup those costs. And so we don't you know, run out of runway. But that would be a last resort type thing, right? Like obviously we would explore things like capital raises and, and you know, as, as long as we've got a decent amount of, of active players and investors can see what that five, 10 year roadmap looks like and, and how we're able to achieve it, even if our games don't quite hit and there's a little bit of uh, tweaks that are required, I think it's going to be an easy sell to be a, to to say like look at the quality of these games we miss the mark a little bit and just to be abundantly clear I don't think that's going to happen mm. but in the case that it did that's what we would we would do you know there there are multiple options for us I think I think that's good I think yeah just sometimes people forget that it it is a DAO and there's a lot of really smart people that the community elects every single epoch and, and they will do what's best and what they need to. Um, and even if that's cutting rev dis in half for a temporary period to figure things out, then I think that's more than reasonable in my opinion. So this question from chat just caught my eye. Um, so I just have to read this one. Heike H says, 
Will Kieran play as a voice actor in the story? <laughs> no, no, I won't. I don't know. I'm I'm not the biggest fan of my voice, to be completely <laughs> honest. I very rarely go back and listen to these uh, these animes. <laughs> I can't. I can't even listen to my own videos. I just, it's. Mm. I, I don't know. I can't do it. <laughs> All right. So we'll move on to Alluvium Beyond now. We don't have a whole lot for this one, and then we'll get to the more juicy ones at the end. How have you felt overall about the performance of Wave One and Wave Two of Alluvium Beyond? Wave One, as I said to to everyone, I was super happy with. I I think <laughs> we we hit all the the numbers that that we wanted to. Mm. Wave two, I can't say the same. You know, we, we've only reactivated 1,200 players. Out of, well, 1,000. There's, there's been about 150 new acquisitions. But, you know, we, we've only reactivated 1,000 people out of the 7,000 that originally played in, uh, in wave one. So I wouldn't say it's been great. Now, there are a few factors there. The game not being out is one, and, and I really think that's going to have a, a, a drastic effect on what happens in Alluvium Beyond because people get the IP and they understand it. Mm-hmm. We're in a bear market. You know, that, that is just a factor, and, and people's funds are, are getting lower and lower, so that's that's got to be a consideration. But the big, big one that I think is, has occurred is changing in pricing. Right, we we've gone and and changed the pricing, and we've made it more accessible to mainstream people. And in doing so, it's dropped the value of those existing Wave One assets dramatically by nearly fifty percent. And I think that's frustrated a lot of people. It's, I mean, it, it couldn't not right. Like if you're sitting there, then you're looking at your entire album's value. And all of a sudden, because the new waves come out and they're much cheaper to get the same sort of tier fives and stage threes and stuff like that, it's it's going to make the price drop just naturally over time. And I think that's had a, a, a big, uh, I think that's been a large factor in this. And, you know, it's frustrating because, as you know, I, I don't think the community knows about this or maybe they've, they've heard rumors or whatever, but I spent <laughs> three days, like literally 10 hours a day for three days trying to convince the, the council to, to not drop prices based on having conversations with people in that top 100 bracket, which were making up 50, 60% of the, the, entire, uh, the, the entire volume of, of discs in that wave one and a lot of them said well if you're going to drop the prices it's going to devalue my assets you know I, I probably won't buy in wave two and i think you know i can't be certain there's obviously other factors as i mentioned but you know from my perspective it's a little bit frustrating that we did that without uh a, an additional data set waiting until wave two because the whole premise of uh, the the whole argument was we're going to appeal to mainstream audiences if we bring the price of discs down. We've acquired an extra hundred people. Like I don't see mainstream people jumping into the IP saying, "Whoa, I got to get a Ramfire," even though I've never even heard of that character in my life. Like mm. you know. So anyway, here, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there are there are so many factors, and I don't think it would have looked much better if we didn't change the pricing. Uh, but I think it would have looked very much the same, if not a little bit better. So I, I agree with you for the most part. Uh, but at the same time as a future looking premise, it's hard to tell. Only time will tell kind of where it goes from here in the end. Um, but I, for the most part, I agree with you. The data didn't indicate that we necessarily needed to drop pricing. And I would have liked to see in wave two, maybe it would have dropped anyways. We would have been like, okay, the data told us we're going to drop it. Um, but until that happened, I, I didn't love it, but it is what it is. And we got to keep moving forward. So the ne- the next thing is in terms of launch dates, there is a huge gap between wave two and wave three. Now, after wave one ended, there was about a four week or six week, I think in the end gap between the two, between wave one and two. And we saw seriously low volume during this period. Um, do you think there's going to be much of an issue if we wait so long to release Wave 3 or kind of where's the thinking there? So the thinking is actually uh, d- 
dependent on the partnership that we've signed. So uh, as you know, we do one partnership per wave and then mm -hmm. we, uh, we, we end up doing a, a collaboration with them where we introduce a promo disc and then we sell that, 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 those promo discs. This partnership, it's not ideal for them to launch uh, in, in, towards the end of the year. It just doesn't work inside their content calendar. And so uh, what I've had initial discussions with mm -hmm. the council on is for us to actually extend this wave out potentially to uh, to, to further into uh, like all the way into early next year. Oh, okay. And the reason for that is not, hey, we want to keep on taking money off <laughs> uh, off the community or anything like that. It's uh, it's actually because I think we missed the mark on the GameStop uh, partnership where we introduced 1,300 new people into the Alluvium Beyond ecosystem and there was nothing else for them to purchase. The game was over mm -hmm. as soon as the, the, the GameStop sale finished and we don't want to do that again, right? With this time, we want to be able to introduce the partnership while the sale is still going. So anyone that wants to, that, that comes in from this partnership has the ability to go and play the game, start sleeving things. They can buy more discs, all of that kind of stuff. And the only way that we can do that and still fit it into their, uh, mm -hmm. their, their calendar of, of events is if we extend it, to be honest, I think the community is probably going to be more happy with us extending it rather than us saying, hey, here's another wave, wave three, go and buy that one prior to uh, prior to open beta. So yeah. you know, if people don't want to buy them, they don't have to. If uh, it, it's, it's just a way for us to keep it open for, for the potential, you know, thousand, two thousand new people that come in from uh, from the new partnership. Yeah, I think I think that's good. And you, you took my next question for the marketing section right out of my mouth. I was going to talk about the GameStop stuff, but I still have a little bit more that I want to talk about there is that you marketed it to the internal community as a major Web2 brand when you were talking to us about it and the future partnership and everything, even though it was under NDA. Um, but their Web2 X account didn't participate from what I saw. So what would you do differently with future web two brands and things like that? Because I feel like at least many feel like the GameStop was very lackluster. And for the reasons you specified already, that was one of the reasons, but I think for me, especially I didn't see many of their activations myself. Um, although I wasn't necessarily the target audience. So there's that as well. So I just, I just love to get your thoughts. So this is part of the reason why I said, you know, this, this product isn't marketed to, to mainstream, right? Like the the whole idea, and, and we got a lot of learnings from that GameStop partnership. Mm. Now, it was sort of, uh, we, were, we were testing the waters, but it was not so risky as us saying, all right, we'll go to a completely new audience that has never experienced Web3. Mm. Like GameStop has an NFT marketplace and they had done many initiatives to do with uh, crypto and, uh, and NFTs and stuff like that. So it wasn't a complete shot in the dark. It was more of a hybrid marketing event, right? And what we saw or what I believe we saw is we got about 15,000 registrations for the game, which, mm. you know, is, is good. If we get those people activated and, and playing once the open beta starts, the amount of revenue that we'll generate from, mm. from those people is uh, it's going to recoup, even though we've already recouped our costs, it's going to, it's going to be uh, a, a definitely a plus, but we also got 1300 Alluvium beyond players as well. Now we know that the, the average, uh, the average spend for an Alluvium beyond player is 170 bucks. So if they're doing, and that's per wave. So if they if they do that, and uh, you know, if that the the set one goes for five waves, you're talking nearly a million dollars in revenue, and we already made revenue off that partnership. So it's easy to look and say, hey, out of the millions of people that we had, we didn't get five hundred thousand people. But again, we're marketing something that doesn't have 
a game that's open where people can play. It's, it's very constrained when it comes to that. And that's why I, I look at this. <coughs> sorry. That's why I look at this, uh, that partnership. And I say it was a, it was a success. And I truly mean that there's been many times where I've come out and I've said, no, nah, that was fucked. We shouldn't have done that. But this was definitely not one of them. And, uh, you know, yes, it could have been way, way more. And I think it, it would be, and it will be with, with, similar types of partnerships moving forward once the game's out. But looking at it without that, I think it's uh, the fact that we, we had a marketing exercise with the largest gaming retailer in the world that actually made money. We didn't, it didn't cost us anything, not a dollar <laughs> run this. And on top of it, it's, it's really opened up the doors to many other partnerships where it's like, oh, they had a deal with GameStop okay, you know, we're not as big as them. That's a publicly traded company. It makes it a lot easier for, for us to sign new partnerships in the future. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I'm, I, I don't see that as a failure. I think it was actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I never said it was a failure, <laughs> but, uh, but many, many thought it was lackluster, but um, that doesn't, sure. but, but I, I like the way you've explained it. I think, I think I agree that there's, there's always so much more to these sorts of things. And especially for future partnerships and building trust and things like that, it's very important. So the, ne the next thing I'll jump into is a question from Splendor. Now, she said, I think many expected uh, the safety pool to be filled by now, especially with the launch of Wave 2. Even myself, I thought Wave 2 could maybe bring it over the edge. And we're seeing a lot more ETH sales compared to SRV2 now as well. Um, but do you think the safety pool will be filled by open beta? It's a tough question now, right? <laughs> I thought it would be too. You know, it, it all depends where, where the market's at. You know, we're talking Q1 now for, for a release, which means in between that, we've got the Aluvatar sales, we've got the Aluvatar uh, trading fees, we've got the partnership that, that's going out. And I saw one of the, the comments in your chat about it being a bad experience. Hundred percent. In terms of in terms of the product, we get it right. Like it, it, I hated it. I've still got discs that I'm not strategically not opening. I'm just like I can't do that. If I get another one of those uh, dokers, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it, right? And the archies and stuff. So uh, we hear you on the product side of things. That is going to be fixed up with the new partnership. It's going to be a much much better experience. And uh, yeah, but I mean. I, I don't know, right? I, I can't tell. If the market comes back a little bit, things start being a, a, a little bit more positive, then maybe, but I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's fair enough. Okay, so we'll move on to the last section of today's stream, and then hopefully if we have a little bit of time at the end, um, I'll go through and grab any questions that people might have. I've missed a lot of questions. I know there's a lot, there's a lot going on right now. I'm trying to keep this really structured for today. So... Uh, bear with me uh, chat but so here's a really interesting one we've got from hatch a lot of these are from the community so put yourselves in the put yourself in the shoe of a community member as a gamer what excites you the most about alluvium and as an investor what excites you the most about alluvium so as an investor it's the revenue distributions obviously i think that that <laughs> that whole idea of if if you could buy a piece of Riot or Blizzard in the early days and you were a massive fan of what they were building and you were right there at the start, like all of that kind of stuff, and you had the, the, the ability mm. to earn from every single dollar that they generated, that whole concept is, is incredible. I've, I've said that from, from day one. Mm. Uh, as a gamer, it's a tough one because I love playing TFT. Right. Like I, I really do love playing TFT, but I've gotten before I left for my wedding, my wife would always be like, what are you doing? Like what I hear this welcome to Summoner's Rift. And she's like, I know you're playing a game. And I'm like, fuck, I'm just testing the game. It's like and she's like, that's not Alluvium. I know it's not Alluvium. <laughs> and I've gotten back into playing League, like actually like mm. not the TFT component, just playing league. And uh, part of me is like, I can't wait for like 10 years down the track 
to, to see this turn into either a MOBA or an MMO and just like that full, full multiplayer experience, that is kind of where I'm at. But, you know, that having said that, I, I'm still a, a huge fan of TFT. I absolutely love it. But there's just something about having that immersion and, and like just there's so much. It's It's more... I don't know. It feels a little bit more exciting than uh, than than what TFT is. But then I played TFT for five years straight, so I might just be over one genre and then into the other. But uh, but yeah, I think for me, it's that long long term vision that we have, where I think we're going to uh, I think we're gonna we're, we're we're gonna do really well out of these first three games, and then once we we build up enough of a war chest that's when we can continue to build out things and the end goal has always been to to have a moba and i just think with all of the the crazy characters that we have it would just be an unbelievable experience for some reason moba seems to be like the unkillable genre like a lot of the big genres fps sandbox that sort of stuff they've existed for a very long time mm. moba is actually probably the youngest one and it's still the most popular one like out of any genre and i think oh. i think that's insane and i i just wonder why but i also wonder if taking that market is going to be difficult but once you have something like um pvp and you're tapping into the riot uh tft market in general i think it'll be a lot easier so i really like that pathway um and i, I look forward to a moba as well i think it'll be awesome with these characters and you've already got a lot of the moves, the QWE and everything that's already set up for you. <laughs> All right. So the next question comes from Big MacBook. What's the biggest obstacle you can see right now when it comes to the current and future success of Alluvium? Just building a good game. Like it's, I mean, it's it's not so much an obstacle. It's it's like a constant thing that that we're battling. Like the, you know, we we had the the hurdles of can we integrate with IMX or, or if not IMX, who are we going to choose and how are we going to overcome the, the hurdles that, that being connected to the blockchain brings? That's now, you know, way, way, way in our, uh, in our taillight. So uh, there's not, there's, there's not anything else right now apart from us launching and making sure that it's a really good game that's, you know, got all of the key things that you look for in a, in a triple A game, but mostly replayability. What's the, you know, when you're sitting there eating dinner, are you thinking about like, God, I just got to jump back on and have one more game. Or are you already over the game once you, you, you finish, you know, a, a single thing. So yeah, it's, it's just about building a really good game. That's, that's the hurdle we need to overcome. I think I, I'm really liking your confidence, especially with a lot of this, this future. I know a lot of the community wants to know where we're going to be at in five years and stuff like that. But I, I really like, I really like how you, if I spoke to you a year or two before, like a year or two ago, you're not necessarily less confident, but you definitely know a lot more about game development now. And you definitely have a much better connection with your team and with where Alluvium is at than you did one year ago. And I think it really shows. And I think it shows that, we're in a good place with Alluvium right now. And I'm looking forward to the next, the next year, two years and up to 10 years, of course. Yeah, up to a hundred years. I'll pass the torch <laughs> to my son one day, if I have one. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one comes from Layla Hole. The roadmap doesn't show the shift from open beta to released game. <laughs> and for me, open beta, I know it doesn't, but for me, open beta has always kind of been released game because I'm so used to everyone launching an early access nowadays. Um, but what does this look like to you? So the reason we don't is we don't have an accurate read on. There's way too many variables to, to be able to accurately predict when we're going to go out of open beta it's obviously something that we'll add to the roadmap but you know that type of thing could potentially be two three years away mm. but like are you imagining because there's been a lot of talk about that monster hunter style game are you imagining that for the released game or something further than that or before that or don't know don't have <laughs> I'll, I'll take it from there then. <laughs> okay so godson brought me a really neat question on, on July 30, Curve Finance got hacked through an exploit in some old code and all the, a lot of the liquidity was drained from some of their systems. 
Um, do you have plans in place to avoid this? I know you guys are pretty rigorous with an audit, but what if something did go wrong? Like what's kind of, what's the security, what are the security uh, processes in place for you guys at the moment? So it, it's, it's just building. I mean, there, there aren't anywhere near as many attack vectors. Like we, we're going to have, we've, we've got two pools that you can stake your, your ILB mm -hmm. into or your ETH ILV in order to get uh, distributions. Obviously, there's potential vulnerabilities when it comes to, you know, being able to hack someone's account and then stealing their assets through that. But, uh, but it's just building robust code, just, just making sure that we go through the, the process of getting multiple. It's not just one audit that we do now. We do multiple audits. Plus, we have uh, a third party, uh, someone, you know, like a, a white hat that, that looks at every piece of uh, every contract that we build. So, you know, there's, there's always going to be the potential for something in this space, but just making sure that things are as robust as possible is, is all you can do. Yeah, you can, you can only do the best job you can. And at the end of the day, that's what's most important, right? So the next one I've got is the community gets a lot of updates regarding game development. However, as Alluvium heads into Q4, will labs provide a documented business plan to make the other elements, such as marketing and overall strategy? Okay, so we'll have to wrap it up here. Unfortunately, Kieran's going to go uh, to another meeting and get the game built. This, I can answer this one, but yeah, I, I do need to. I do need this to my, talk to another one. That one looks really question. buggy. If, I, if I'm like, oh, you're asking about something that we don't do, no. Uh, but no, so so the answer is a lot of the marketing stuff that we do is under NDA. Uh, a lot of the strategic stuff that we do is under NDA. Is not under NDA, but it's it, there's competitors and and stuff like mm. that that we don't want them knowing all the information of of our entire strategy so uh you know now having said that governance v2 brings uh a new realm where we're at, they are under nda and so a lot of that stuff we can go through and uh and share with with the council and, and we have been doing that but opening it up to, you know, our entire community, our, our, all of our strategic plan and, and stuff like that, mm. that's, uh, that's, that's definitely not happening anytime in, uh, in the near future. So that's that. Uh, but just in terms of uh, the overworld, because I know Pierre is asking what's the, the status of the overworld, to make it less boring, yes, for open beta, there are going to be a few features that you haven't heard about that are really, really cool. Uh, there will be things like uh, quests. There will be things like mm. uh, uh, faction points that you get to to go and unlock little mini games and missions and stuff like that. Which you know, choose your faction wisely because <laughs> you know, that, that type of stuff is is coming. And uh, and yeah, so we again we take the feedback. We don't sit there and go, you know what, we've given you a boring game, and we're going to continue to give you a boring game now. <laughs> Having said that, I still believe we give you the exact same game, but you go and capture something and you can go and sell it on the marketplace. It becomes 10 times more exciting, but we're not here to just say, hey, you can earn from this game and that's the hook. We totally take that, uh, that mm -hmm. feedback on board and there's going to be some really, really awesome stuff in the overall. So that was actually the last question on my list. So we managed to get through them all. I really appreciate you spending the time to talk with me today, Kieran. Um, I couldn't appreciate it more. It, it, it's really awesome. And I look forward to talking with you and the other Warwick brothers and other members from the team even more in the future, especially as we head into open beta. Is there anything else you want to close off with talking to the community or anything like that? No, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm back. I'm locked and loaded. I'll be... Uh... If you haven't seen, I'm, I've been on pretty religiously the last uh, the last week or so since I've I've gotten back. So, you know, I'm hopefully going to be able to get around to all of the different uh, content creators inside of our community. We're we're looking to bring on a couple more to to really get the reach out. It's it's kind of typical to what we do before a, mm -hmm. a product release. So I think people are, are used to it. But uh, but yeah, I'm I'm excited to get to to dig back in. I'm, I'm probably going to be dead by the time that uh, that open beta launches, but uh, <laughs> you know, who, you won't need me at that point. So <laughs> no worries there. So thanks so much, Kieran. We really appreciate it. 
All good. Thanks, Scoriox. Really appreciate it.